Joining us today for a special conversation is Dr. Robert Metcalf. Many of you know him as the inventor of Ethernet, uh, the communications backbone that really underlies almost everything that we do today. But you may also know him as the founder of 3Com and for Metcalf's Law. Bob began his career, uh, his pioneering work in 1970 at MIT, followed by Harvard, Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center, and Stanford. And we are thrilled today to have him not just as an icon, but as a champion of networking to this day. But for the last decade, Bob has been working with the next generation of technologists and business leaders as a professor of innovation at the Cockrell School of Engineering at the University of Texas in Austin. Bob is also the founding director of UT Austin's Innovation Center, and he is the professor of entrepreneurship at the Macomb School of Business and Murchison Fellow of Free Enterprise. More recently, Bob became the principal investigator of Texas Geo, which is incubating startups to advance technologies delivering cheap, safe, clean, and ubiquitous geothermal energy. Bob, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. So here's a first question. Um, you know, there have been a few of these research center centers, right? Cradles of innovation that were the birthplace of so many technologies that shape our lives to this day. And Xerox Park was certainly one of those, right? We got laser printing, um, object-oriented programming, the modern mouse GUI, uh, UI, and of course, Ethernet. So what was it like to be there? Because it sounds amazing. Well, it was heaven on earth. Imagine us uh, tucked away in a building in the hills of Palo Alto uh, with the temperatures always 71 degrees. Uh, and the uh, computer science lab had been formed by uh, Bob Taylor, who uh, may he rest in peace, who was, uh, he was a alumnus of the University of Texas at Austin, by the way. But he then, uh, at ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Department of Defense, was involved in funding computer science around the world. And when it came time for him to build a computer science lab at the Xerox Research Center in Palo Alto, he picked a lot of people from the, from the uh, ARPA community, me included, and then uh, gave us a general mission, which was to research technologies related to the paperless office of the future, which is mildly ironic since Xerox's entire business was based on producing paper by the ton. And we joined in, we invented the laser printer and, uh, and uh, produced more paper than ever before, much to the frustration of the, of the paperless office people. And uh, it was, uh, it was uh, like I said, heaven on earth. We had one meeting a week that we were obliged to attend and it was, was the meeting was called Dealer and it was, uh, um, or I think it was noon on Tuesday, but I could be wrong about that. And so we would have to, all of us were off doing, writing computer programs and building things. But every once in a while, every Tuesday at noon, we would come together where there would be a guest speaker. Uh, and then we would share progress reports. And everyone would lie about how much progress they made that week on their various projects, which was entertaining. And the speeches given at Dealer were recruiting speeches. They were People, people we were recruiting come and give a presentation at dealer, and then uh, that would be part of the recruiting process. So Palo Alto, endless summer, uh, no obligation to do anything. I didn't have to raise money. I didn't have to teach courses. Now, Xerox Park could be viewed, should be viewed, I think, usefully as a lab of Stanford University. So we, it w the lab was put in Palo Alto to be near Stanford, and then most of the researchers became professors at Stanford. So I became a uh, consulting associate professor at Stanford, uh, engaged with some of the research there, but also mostly teaching a course every semester. Um, so that, that was fun too. That, that sounds amazing. Like the idea of pure R&D really does sound like heaven on earth, certainly for a lot of our audience who, you know, they don't necessarily get to do that and they have more than one meeting a week. Uh, but what's it been like since then to watch so many of those technologies really just become uh, taken for granted? Like they are ubiquitous and everywhere. Um, do they sort of go off on their own or do you still get a feeling of, of ownership for um, a lot of that work? Well, uh, as you've indicated, a lot of really cool things that we take for granted came out of various labs in the computer science lab, but the uh, uh, a problem developed in that there was no way for those um, technologies to be applied anywhere. 
Xerox was the company itself was slow to adopt these technologies and certainly slow to turn them into products. So then what started happening is people started leaving Park to start companies. I left to start 3Com, Adobe spun out, the list goes on, uh, lots of companies. And then Xerox said, wait a minute, we, we're, we're letting, uh, leaving money on the table here. So Xerox started investing in some of these companies as they spun out. And uh, so there's a, a lot of lessons and books have been written about the innovation process. One of the books is named Fumbling the Future. And it's about how how uh, Xerox failed to um, uh, exploit the technologies which it had developed in its lab. I think it's the book's a little rough on on Xerox. One thing my colleagues do uh, at Park when they talk about the, the good old days at Park, they refer to Xerox as they. And I, I hasten to remind them that no, it's it was us. We were we were making the mistakes. It's not, it's not really fair to blame Xerox for everything. Uh, plus, Xerox did actually get a lot out of Park. In particular, the laser printer business became a multi-billion-dollar business uh, spun out of the Xerox Research Center. So you mentioned that you know technology, or at least the way that innovation happens, where it happens, the mechanisms have changed over the years. So how has that changed from that uh, pure R and D um, corporation backed to where it's coming from now? Well, the big change uh, you'll hear is a lament. People will refer nostalgically to the good old days of Xerox Park or the good old days of Bell Labs, which was the father of all these or mother of all these research labs. And they're pretty much gone now. Bell, I mean, Bell Labs still exists, but it may have 1,000 people instead of 25,000 people. Xerox right. Park still exists in the hills of Palo Alto, uh, but its, its emphasis has shifted and you don't hear so much about it. It's doing, it's, it's owned by Xerox, but half of its work is for Xerox and the other half is, is contract work for, uh, sponsors. So it, it's, uh, yeah, there's this funny thing. I, I, oddly, I graduated from the last good class to graduate from my high school. And then I graduated from the last good class to graduate from MIT and and then I graduated from Xerox Park, the last year of its preeminence as a research center. Why is it that I always see my departure as the end of uh, wherever I'm leaving? <laughs> oh, I know what that is. That's called ego, uh, uncontrollable ego. That's what it is. Well, okay. So here's one for you. You you you're in the the Tuesday noon meeting. You get to have some amazing pitches. People are talking about technology, and obviously not every technology spun out. So what was a project that you saw that would have maybe changed the world that never made it out? There's quite a diversity of projects all the way from the network all the way up mm -hmm. to the – but, you know, the databases were not on the scheme. The War Wide Web was not anticipated by this research. Those are two gaps. Uh, mobility was not um, – these were desktop workstations we were working with. So we had taken the step from uh, time-shared mini computers to desktop PCs with local area networks connecting them. But we didn't make the step to the World Wide Web, and we didn't, at least not while I was there, and we didn't make the step to uh, uh, to mobility, both of which are very big today and were not anticipated by the park research. So connectivity really ended up being a, a critical part of that because it's hard to imagine things like modern mobility based on what expectations for uh, bandwidth would have looked like in the 70s? Yeah, well, bandwidth was uh, uh, scarce until about 19, the early 70s. Uh, Ethernet, for example, I, the day before I had Ethernet installed in my office, I had the latest computer terminal, a, a Texas Instrument Silent 700. It ran at 30 characters per second. And the uh, RS-232 network carried bits at 300 bits per second. The next day, the, in, the Ethernet gets installed at 2.94 megabits per second. And I'll do the arithmetic for you. That's an increase by a factor of 10,000. So the bandwidth, I think... Ethernet sort of was part of the revolution that said bandwidth is not going to be scarce. Bandwidth is now going to be abundant. And, and by abundant, 
eventually that meant uploading cat pictures. You would ne- prior to Ethernet, you would never upload a cat picture. It would take too long and be too expensive. But now you can do it anytime you want. So that was a, a real part of the focus on uh, Ethernet was that it was going to be able, or it was the solution to be able to deliver the bandwidth that was otherwise throttling a lot of innovation around it. That's right. And so, for example, we were building this laser printer. It was a page per second, 500 dots per inch. So eight and a half by 11 by 500 by 500 per second is is a megabit, 20 megabits per second. So the old RS-232 interface running it you know, at the most 10 kilobits per second would never keep that printer busy. The printer would be sitting there downloading files all day and not printing. But so that was one of the requirements that pushed Ethernet to be fast. So one of the principles associated with the Ethernet brand is build it and they will come. Build the Ethernet, the current Ethernet, as fast as you possibly can with existing semiconductors. And then the applications will follow somehow serendipitously uh, so the so ethernet started at 2.94 megabits per second but today they're beginning to sh- uh, get ready to ship 400 gigabits per second so there's been a huge increase as the semiconductors got better the networks got faster yeah, it's, it's been amazing, those high speeds where it goes back and forth between fiber and then copper continues to be able to push bandwidth that really would have been hard to imagine. Um, was it was it pretty straightforward getting it off the ground or you ran into barriers or what, what was that process for really letting it, for helping it take hold? Well, I see it as a battle. One of the things I teach is the difference between invent, what I call invention and innovation. An invention is done in a lab and everyone loves you and you're given, you're sponsored and, you know, you're a a celebrity inventing stuff. And then you try to innovate and innovation is, uh, that is bring it to market and have it adopted by the uh, world markets. And that is not a nice process. The status quo is resourceful and nasty. So getting Ethernet uh, Ethernet won a, a war. We call it the LAN wars, the local area networking wars that Ethernet eventually won. But it took 20, 30 years for Ethernet to win that battle. And the struggle started right at Xerox Research. We had David Boggs and I built the first Ethernet. We hadn't even built it yet when a physicist at Park sent a memo to my boss's boss saying that Ethernet Without, by the way, without talking with me, which means he was a physicist. He didn't understand people. So instead of talk, talking to me about what we were doing, he just fires off a memo to my boss's boss <coughs> saying Ethernet was basically a fraudulent project because it was not quantum noise limited. That is, that cable that we were sharing to send our packets was not draining every bit per second it could out of the cable. But of course, to do so would have cost money to build the electronics and so on. So so we ran at 2.94 megabits per second, and he tried to kill our project because it wasn't quantum noise limited, which is, of course, not one of our not one of our goals. Uh, so that was just the beginning of the fights. And, the, you know, it lasted during the uh, when we tried to standardize Ethernet, which we did through the IEEE starting in 1980, IBM and General Motors Two large, two large companies decided they didn't like the idea that Xerox would make a standard called Ethernet. So they developed their own alternatives. IBM introduced the IBM token ring and General Motors introduced the General Motors token bus. And they both showed up at the IEEE to derail Ethernet, which was in the process of being standardized. They got very, it got so ugly that the IEEE courageously standardized all three. So, so instead of choosing one, the IEEE thickened out and, and made the IBM token ring and the General Motors token bus and Ethernet were all, all became standards. IEEE 802.3 was Ethernet, IEEE 802.4 was token bus, and IEEE 802.5 was IBM token ring. And it took, dec- it took a decade or two to kill them uh, because they <laughs> – well, IBM was the dominant computer company in the world. General Motors was General Motors. I remember telling the guy, hey, why don't you guys make cars and I'll make the networks? 
And they said, no, 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 we're the customer and we're, we have a particular idea, the token bus, which it, that one was easy to kill. That died in a, a small number, a single digit number of years. The token ring, on the other hand, persisted for decades uh, because of the preeminence of IBM. Yeah, my my first enterprise gig, it was Token Ring. Uh, it was Netware and Token Ring, and yeah, it was it was a thing. Um, so my two yeah, arch so enemies, Token Ring, uh, uh, Netware, so Novella and 3Com, my company, were competitors mm -hmm. for about three or four years. We were at each other's throats, um, and, and Token Ring lasted way longer than that uh, because of once again IBM's pre preeminence. It was a good day when we finally switched out the big brick uh, four pin connectors from token ring to a nice uh, yeah. RJ45. RJ so, okay, so IEEE standardizes all three standards. So then it's the technology just won or it turned into a sales process or what was the, the next step in terms of market adoption? The token bus died quickly. So the token ring became the focus. And basically it was everybody except IBM was in favor of ethernet and against IBM. And, and so we had all, we had uh, HP, we had DEC on the ethernet side. Uh, plus we had a flock of startups, including 3Com, but many startups and ethernet was the ethernet patents were put into the public domain as part of the standardization process. So startups were cropping up all over the place, competing with uh, 3Com, for example. Uh, and IBM didn't really understand the game. They they saw the standardization of Ethernet, and so they said, "Okay, we'll get a standardized token ring." Ha ha! But their heart wasn't in it. They're, you know, in their in their heart of hearts, they were used to setting standards. So their uh, 3Com shipped IBM token ring ahead of IBM. Startups are generally faster than big companies. But then we had trouble selling it because IBM had software dust that it sprinkled over its <laughs> it's hardware. So we had a hard time getting our token ring cards to work on IBM customer sites. So IBM maintained market share, you know, dominant market share in token ring. Whereas Ethernet, it was hard to maintain a dominant market share there because it was so competitive, fiercely competitive among the Ethernet suppliers. But you started talking about the value of networking as a part of 3Com's message, right? <laughs> to be able to enable innovation and technology, you needed to actually be able to get the value of the network. And this is where Metcalf's law came from. So was this, talk to us about the formation of that and whether you consider that as sort of sales and adoption innovation, or is that still technology engineering innovation? Well, we, we developed an ethernet card for the IBM PC. And uh, and started selling it, and uh, we learned that no one had any IBM PCs. That it they were brand new, so it was very hard to find customers. So uh, and then they were reluctant. They were just learning about PCs, so they were reluctant to do adventurous things. So we offered a three-node uh, trial network for three thousand dollars. You got three of our cards, boom, 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 and the three PCs and a cable to connect the three PCs together and a diskette with software on it. And what that software allowed you to do is three important things, share a printer, share a big disk, uh, and exchange emails among three PCs. And uh, the printers were expensive. Like the laser, you know, the laser printer from Apple was a $7,000 printer. So the idea of sharing it made sense today. Since printers cost a hundred dollars. It's uh, a different scene. Disks were, IBM had just come out with a 20 megabyte hard disk, which no one knew how to use. It was just so huge. And uh, we allowed you to sh have three PCs all keep their files on a shared uh, IBM disk. And then there was exchanging emails. So our customers bought these trial kits uh, from this little startup uh, out there in uh, Santa Clara. I guess we were in Mountain View at that time. And they... Uh, they worked. You could share a printer, you could share a disk, you could exchange email. But the customers all said, that's fine and good, and you kept your promise. They do what they do, but it's not useful. Well, that's a terrible thing to hear <laughs> from your customers. And uh, I was head of sales and marketing, so it was my jo at that time, it was my job to uh, solve this problem. So I went to Stanford one night and went into a trance and developed a 35-millimeter slide. We didn't have PowerPoint, understand. 
that showed that the the cost of a network was sort of linear in the number of my cards that you bought, but the value was the number of potential connections. And the number of potential connections among n nodes is approximately n squared. So then I associated that with value, that it was valuable to connect things together. Hence the formula V is approximately, uh, V grows as n squared. The value of a network grows as the square of the number of attached people, devices, whatever. And this slide uh, was not called Metcalf's Law. It was just a, a 35 millimeter slide. My, I made six copies of the slide because my sales force had six people in it. And they carefully inserted this slide into their carousels with their other 35 millimeter slides and went out to the customers and basically told the customers, the reason your networks are not useful is they are too small. And the remedy for that is to buy more of our products. And they did. And so with that pitch alone, we went public in 1984 based on the sales stemming from that. And uh, it paid off. That is when they grew the networks, the networks actually were more valuable. And then the question arises, when I made this slide up and I gave it to the sales force, was I lying? I was, after all, a sales and marketing executive. Was I lying when I made that slide? And the answer is no, uh, because I had the benefit of a time machine. I was able to go into the future with a time machine. And that time machine was the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, where I had enjoyed the, uh, what Dave Boggs and I and others did there is we filled Xerox with PCs and LANs and routers and printers. Mm -hmm. We basically built a prototype of the internet inside of Xerox. And then when it came time to start the company, I came back from the future in my time machine. And when I wrote that slide, I knew that it was correct. That is, I knew, because I'd seen it. We, we all saw the inside wow. internet at Xerox and saw that it was good. So no, I was not lying when I made that slide. Now that slide in 1995, 15 years later, uh, was uh, picked up by a guy named George Gilder, a famous futurist, and he called that slide Metcalf's Law. So I've been defending it ever since. So, there, so there's a question there then, and this goes back to innovation, right? You, you started as a, a, a practical engineer working on the protocol. And you end up as a sales and marketing executive engineering an equation to help demonstrate that while, yeah, you're limited to three cards in your starter kit, we have way more nodes running in our lab, and this is how you can actually measure the value. So is that a career change, or is that just an extension of technology innovation to help move something forward and drive adoption? Well, for me, it was a career change and a very unusual one. It's, it's very difficult to convert an engineer into a marketing person. By the way, it's much harder to convert a marketing person into an engineering person. So as hard as both of those are, I did the easier one. But very few people um, choose to make such a transition, and I did. And But that's not uh, determinative of the innovation process. The uh, What we were using was a time-tested model of innovation called the Silicon Valley Startup System. And we just fell into it and leveraged. We had venture capitalists. We had the 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 uh, uh, titles on our business cards were all borrowed from HP. We had program managers, project managers, senior engineers, and all titles that had been finally developed and specified by HP. We just adopted them uh, full speed. So, uh, so so there's my making the transition to salesman. And from engineer to salesman, and then separately, there's uh, 3Com using the Silicon Valley innovation system to put Ethernet into business, into the internet. Well, the question is a little bit personal for me uh, as well, because most of my career I was an engineer, and now I'm not marketing exactly, but I play with marketing, right? <laughs> and so a lot of that is that thought about remembering that you know business is about making money, right? But for engineers or a lot of uh, engineers that are maybe in IT and in operations, you know, work is really about innovating to solve problems, right? So you've been on both sides of that, though. So how do you encourage tech professionals um, to maybe either ride that line between leadership and engineering 
or um, uh, you know, sort of innovation and business development versus profitability? Well, one of the problems that I, as head of sales and marketing is that the salespeople in our company were paid more than engineers. That is, they had quotas, and so their their compensation was contingent on successful selling, but they had a lot of upside, and generally salespeople are paid more than engineers. And this annoyed my people. My engineers were annoyed by this. So I did the, uh, I'll share this secret. This is what you do when you have this problem. I said, okay, you can be a salesperson now. I say this to the engineer, and we're going to Syracuse tomorrow. And we're going to take the red eye and then we're going to wake up for a 7 a.m. breakfast meeting with a bunch of hostile people in Syracuse, New York. No, Schenectady. I'm sorry. That, where the GE Center is. I remember that. I, we're going to stay at a Ramada Inn. I've stayed at every Ramada Inn that there is, I think. And uh, we're going to answer hostile questions over breakfast tomorrow and then we're going to go from there to mid-morning and then we're going to go there for lunch and then we're going to uh, suffer fools gladly all afternoon because our competitor has gotten there ahead of us and has poisoned the water with all sorts of accusations about our products which we're going to have so the engineers after about a week of this would uh, see what see what was up and go back to engineering which was uh, so engineers and salespeople are both carbon based life forms but they're substantially different and uh uh i'm not sure i'm answering your question but the uh uh, now, it's not as if engineers are not interested in money. There you have a case where it annoyed them that salespeople were paid more than they were. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, and then, and then, the, then there's the question as uh, they, everyone wants to advance. And if you're an engineer, do you advance by being a more of an engineer or more of a manager? So we, we at our company as, and other companies too developed a dual track where you could get promoted and increased compensation on either track, either as a manager or as an engineer. You didn't have to switch to management in order to make more money. We wanted to eliminate that. Uh, and while we're speaking of money, we discovered at one point that the development engineers at our company looked down on the manufacturing engineers at our company. And so there was a status, an annoying cultural status thing between development engineers and manufacturing engineers. But we were shipping quantity million products at one point. And those manufacturing engineers, just by f tweaking a little something, could make an extra $10 million of profit that year by speeding up some process. So they were very important to our company at quantity million. And uh, so we, one day we just went around and gave all the manufacturing engineers a 20% raise, just boom, and, and, and um, uh, uh, made public the idea that th those engineers were as important, if not more so, than the development engineers. That was a, a cultural problem. Yeah, I, I, from my experience, I, I've been in software for most of my life, and um, I have a, an, a deep respect for anyone in semiconductor and hardware because you can't fix it after it's deployed. Um, the the uh, ramp up time for from engineering to production is is pretty long, right? So uh, it's got to be actually engineered, not just sort of delivered um, at the time that it, it appears on the shelf. Um, so let me let me take that back a little bit and 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 ask another question. So what was the biggest surprise over the last 20 years as we've moved from central uh, well-funded pure R&D research centers and we've seen folks transition between engineering and sales and marketing and advocacy? Um, what was the biggest surprise to you uh, in tech and what really made that stand out? Well, there's a lot of surprises, so it's hard to pick one, but uh, for example, in 19, the mid nineties, there emerged a thing called, uh, dense wave division multiplexing of optical fibers, something I know nothing about. Uh, it was a silver bullet for the internet and it was a surprise because suddenly the cost of sending bits across country went down by factors of 10, thanks to dense wave division multiplexing, something that no, no one had ever heard of before. It came out of Bell Labs. 
and then was picked up by startups. And suddenly, bandwidth was cheap. You just had to bury these fibers here and there or string them from a pole. That was a surprise. Another surprise was when this all started, we thought the internet was going to connect these um, uh, time-shared uh, mini computers with interactive dumb terminals, uh, you know, teletypes and glass teletypes and uh, 3270s at IBM. And the PCs came along, and suddenly we were not building the internet for interactive time sharing. We were building the internet for desktop personal computers. Ethernet, for example, took a big step forward. Until Ethernet, the packet switching of the internet stopped at the interactive time sharing machine. And then its software talked to these dumb terminals and typed characters on them. Ethernet carried those packets, the Internet's packets, all the way to the desktop. So software running on your PC could use the packet nature of the Internet directly. It didn't have to go through a, a dumb terminal emulation. So that was a big surprise. Another big surprise is at the beginning of this, this Internet thing, this 3Com thing, uh, it was nerds selling to nerds. I mean, I was uh, uh, head of sales and marketing, and that worked because my customers were fellow engineers mostly. So I had standing, and I could talk their language. The Internet changed all that. Starting in the mid-'90s with the World Wide Web, suddenly the important people on the Internet shifted. It was uh, the, the nerds became less important, and the channel marketing people became more important, and all the numbers started having zeros after them. So my company, when we went public uh, in March of 84, we raised $11 million, <laughs> which is not what you do anymore because the markets are so much bigger. Our, our markets were a uh, $100 million a year company was a big deal. And now you have to be a $100 billion a, company, a year company to, you know, to be important. So that was a surprise. Uh, the shift – the scaling up of uh, information technology in general and the change of people uh, necessary to be successful change. And that was a, uh, that was a surprise also. So you mentioned nerds selling to nerds, right? Um, and that certainly involves a lot of uh, buzzwords and almost selling innovation as a, as a quality in and of itself. Um, but that, has that but it hasn't exactly changed if you're on the ground in an IT organization, right? Vendors come in and they hit you with a lot of buzzwords and a lot of promises. Um, like prior, right now, there's a lot of a focus on AI and ML. How how do how do individual technologists, how do IT professionals navigate that sort of geek focused uh, feeds and speeds bud, buzzwords to actually glean and and the technology that will be really useful? Well, now you're talking about my people. You're talking about my customers. 3Com sold to network people, network managers, IT managers, IT professionals in general. And uh, and I was one of the vendors showing up with speeds and feeds. Uh, mm -hmm. Ethernet and networking in general was fierce, is and was fiercely competitive. And so I'm I'm uh, I'm really good at speeds and feeds and why my products are better than the other ones and so on. And I have a lot of respect for the the um, one of the things that my people do did is uh, make standards. And they would uh, they would choose. Uh, I remember when I was when I was running InfraWorld, uh, the IT department came forward and said there are people using Macintoshes here, and we'd like to stop that because we'd like to support only Windows machines. And I said, well, you're never going to get a Macintosh away from the art department. So we had, a, we had a, like most magazines, an art department where everybody wears black all day. And those people were never going to give up their Macintoshes. So there's that corporate standard thing that, that we were always running into. And, our, and so when I'm out peddling Ethernet to CIOs, the high end of the IT uh, chain, uh, we had no success at all. In, in our day, CIOs were all effectively employees of the IBM Corporation. And the expression that we used at 3Com was that uh, w at that account, we're going to have to wait for the CIO to die. 
because we're never going to sell to that guy because he's an IBM guy through and through. So what we at a company had to do was sell to people other than IBM's CIOs. So we went down to work groups and began selling to people, to network managers who were much closer to the business than the corporate standard stuff. And we slipped in and we went came in through retail and, and through distributors instead of through a direct sales force like IBM. So we just dodged all the, the IBM culture out there and just came in uh, underneath it. Uh, so then you then the, the next important question is why would a sane IT manager buy products from a startup? Why would you buy products from a startup if you're an IT guy? And I know what the answer is because I ran into it time and time again. Our customers had competitors and they wanted our products. They were willing to risk, go out on the bleeding edge of technology in order to gain advantage over their competitors. So in essence, I have a, gr a great deal of regard for uh, competition. Competition makes the world go round. So we were competing, but our customers were also competing. And that's what opened them up to buying products from a dirtball little startup like we had. Was well, that a little bit like the relationship between um – artists and art critics when you're talking about sort of uh, frontline engineers and then and then leaderships you know where in um, in art a lot of the the um, uh, uh, not so much market but like world of art and its promotion is led by art critics but the engineers can sometimes feel or the artists sometimes feel like their creativity is a little bit constrained by that system how can I how can IT professionals and managers help sort of break out or maybe communicate better when confronted with um, a real buzzwordy um, technology investigation or um, a chance to uh, focus on the business value of technology instead of just, hey, this is cool, let's implement it. So where I come out on that is that I don't view buzzwords pejoratively. That is, I think buzz buzzwords play a role in the curation of new technologies and and we use buzz, buzzwords to navigate to get the sense of very uh, complicated things so i'm a uh, i i pay attention to language and and uh, think buzzwords are a tool of innovation and uh, rather than um, just marketing bull that people make although there's a lot of that uh, i netted out that the it managers need and uh, should use buzzwords as a tool for uh, discussing what's going on in the space. Um, so they so they can actually be a, a center for conversation and a way of de-jargonifying the conversation between different groups. It's also shorthand, and it's mm -hmm. it's also branding, and it's it's a mix of things. So the, you know, PC lands, PC lands. Have you heard that expression? Uh, no. You're, so, so you're too young. So the buzzword in the 80s during our uh, big move was personal computers arrived. And for a while, Bill and Steve wanted their PCs to be standalone. But then Ethernet came along in other lands. And then it became PC lands as a buzzword. Now we're, I'm talking buzzword here. Personal computers connected by local area networks. And then after that, that evolved into client server. Where the, have you heard of that term, client server? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a major buzzword, too. And it followed on PC LANs, and it described the process where you actually added servers to the network, mm -hmm. and, uh, like database servers or uh, routers, and then you access them over the LAN. So there's a succession of buzzwords, P, uh, mini computers, time sharing, PCs, PC LANs, client server, and now what is it called? Now cloud. Now it's the cloud computing. It was web and mobility and, and cloud, yeah. And now um, a, uh, artificial intelligence oh. and machine learning. Yeah, now uh, that's a special case. AI is, uh, my thesis advisor in college was Marvin Minsky, one of the founders of AI. So I've been watching AI for 50 years and it comes and it goes. And the uh, so this is like the third or fourth or fifth time AI machine learning has uh, captured the limelight. Uh, this time I'm more optimistic because uh, in the past, my analysis of past um, 
failures of AI, that's too strong, but um, uh, fading of AI had to do with AI depends on data. And they would run out of data. And then it would, it would sort of flop. But now we have the internet. And the internet can deliver data. So I, I'm optimistic, much more optimistic about AI this time uh, because the internet is there and uh, and it, it's there to feed data to the AIs. And, and the AIs without data, they flop, but with data, they do amazing things. So we talked a little bit about Metcalf's law. What are some of the other laws that govern connectivity? Well, I think of two right away. There's Moore's law, which is very famous. And Moore's law, both makes it easier to implement networks, but also generates demand for networks. It makes uh, processors much faster and able to process much more data more quickly. Then there's Shannon's law, which came out of the Professor Claude Shannon, MIT professor, Bell Labs researcher, which measured the bit rate through a noisy channel, basically. And while we were hoping to use AT&T's cable network, their co copper that they've been installing for 100 years, uh, to use it to carry our data into in between buildings. AT&T informed us that the that copper was limited in bandwidth according to Shannon's law. It could only carry 14.4 kilobits per second. So any hope of going faster than that would be a violation of Shannon's law. Not too long after that, a company started selling 50 kilobit per second modems, which you'll notice 50 kilobits per second is quite a bit higher than 14.4 kilobits per second. So what what happened to Shannon's law and what happened is that the telephone company over its 100 years learned how to install copper better and better. So the capability of the copper network was beyond what they thought it was and the internet people immediately exploited that with 50 kilobit per second. Um, modems, which teaches you that you have to be careful with these laws. That the, you know, they have a, they probably are very useful, but they also have a limited range, and you have to be careful not to overuse them. And, that, and I'm sure that goes for Metcalf's law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, when reception uh, sensitivity and error correction really allowed the reuse of copper in a new way, and I can remember, you know. I think we all remember listening to modems connect and going through their tests to try to up level the comms and multi-channel. And now with DOS's uh, what three one here at the house, I'm um, a gig down and half a gig up, and that just seems really hard to believe over copper that's been <laughs> buried in the backyard for forty years. Um, but I want to go back to something that you said earlier, um, talking about you know sort of famous characters or, or famous uh, contributors in, in innovation. You talked about Bill Gates and especially Steve Jobs, right? And you know not everyone can create, but we certainly all consume and utilize. Um, you know we tend to notice those standards that have lasting effects on on tech. <clears throat> so why do you think we're so uh, fascinated by the creator? Um, um, the you know what's created and and really invention as a as a standalone um, moment. So you're asking why why are we so fascinated by it? Mm -hmm. why, it? why do we why why do we remain fascinated by um, um, some of the the creators, the individual people, or maybe famous people who's who um, are proponents for technology or drive it forward? Okay, so the the big goals are. Um, freedom and prosperity and they form those two form a virtuous circle and the thing that drives that circle is innovation so prosperity through innovation drives freedom and freedom through innovation drives prosperity so this is important stuff we're talking about we're talking about freedom and prosperity and innovation is the principal driver of freedom and prosperity. So we want to know how to do more of it and do better of it because it will improve our lives greatly. So then there are people like Gates and Jobs who played a, a pivotal role in, in major innovations. We want to study them to figure out what they did, how they did it uh, to advance innovation because we all, we want more of it. We need much more of it. So, uh, I think that's the answer. It has to do with the importance of innovation is so high that the people who do it well, and uh, currently it's Elon Musk is our is our champion of innovation these days. We want to know everything about Elon, so maybe we can all be 
uh, little elons and and it, uh, and that and thereby advance freedom and prosperity. I think it's as simple as that. So we're all seeking education about innovation. It's like really macro. Yeah, like what? Is, how do they do that? I want to do that too. Or now, this some of it is just curiosity about their quirks, you know, and and fame gets involved, and fame has a sort of a distorting factor. But no, I think deep down we want to know how they did it because we want to do it too, and uh, because it's so important. So we don't have seven thousand dollar laser printers anymore. Um, maybe the ink, but not the printer. Um, the internet has been has extended connectivity and um, um, access in a way that really would have been uh, impossible to imagine, maybe hard to imagine. <laughs> is it in its final form? Is the is the internet done? Or as you mentioned um, earlier, uh, Elon, like uh, we, we watched on stage with the prototype of you know some of the um, uh, brain implant, right? Is is that where this ultimately goes? Or um, does the inter- does the internet end up being reinvented at some point? Well, you've asked a very important question to which is a very clear answer. The internet is not done yet. You could argue it will never be done, but it's certainly not done yet. And uh, so, for example, in 50 years, the internet has managed to reach 55% of the human race, 4.7 billion people. In only 50 years, really sudden adoption. But I've just told you about reach, how many people were reached. So that's a dimension of the connectivity provided by the internet, reach. Then there's we've talked about speed. Well, speed's another dimension. We used to reach them at 300 baud, whoever we reached. We almost reached nobody, but the ones we reached, we reached at 300 baud. Now we're beginning to reach them at a uh, gigabit per second, which is quite a bit faster. So that's a dimension of the network. And then there's latency. How long does it take to do a round trip? And that's key in uh, uh, video. This video conferencing we're doing is very latency dependent. If the latency were much higher, it would be unusual. But thank goodness, it's not higher. And here we are talking uh, long distances with no discernible uh, latency. So latency is also a dimension of this connectivity. But the list of dimensions goes on and on and on, like the security some some networks are very secure and others are not. Uh, cost, the uh, cost of internet connection, cost alone is a very important dimension. So my point is, uh, we're proceeding down all of these dimensions in parallel at different rates, and there's a, a lot to go. And you can see it now. We've been, uh, when the internet started, it was a kilobit internet. The transcontinental trunks of the original internet ran at 50 kilobits per second. And then through the 80s and 90s, we enjoyed the megabit internet. And now we are going over to the gigabit internet. And it's uh, it's going to create a lot of opportunities for new unanticipated surprising applications as it has in previous advances. Also, there's been progress in the arrival of new um models of networking. Uh, right now, we're networking people, 4.7 billion of us, but there are 8 billion so-called things on the internet already. So now the internet is going from, uh, it, today's internet is video, by the way, most of the traffic on the internet is video. So we have a video megabit internet. We're now going to a gigabit internet. That'll carry video, of course, but now it's going to start carrying the traffic among so-called things. We call them things because we don't know what they are yet. But as we <laughs> discover what they are, we'll use their real names. So the gigabit internet of things is the next the next phase. I, I So is the internet done? No, it's not nearly done because think of all the headroom we have in all those dimensions. Uh, uh, costs, for example, a lot of headroom there. Okay, so here, so here's a question about the s- scope of the internet, right? I think a lot of folks think <laughs> about, let's say you're at home, um, you got a decent cable connection that's way faster than it was even five years ago. You're working online with this fantastic application at your bank that's way more responsive and it's mobile uh, compliant and it it just seems great. 
But behind that, there's a lot of technology that just doesn't change, right? We we saw that um, situation during COVID where the state of New Jersey was desperately seeking COBOL programmers because they needed to make changes to their benefit systems in order to, to get um, support out there. So are some of those technologies like COBOL just forever and that's okay? Well, I wouldn't say forever, but for a very long time. The, uh, the RS-232 standard uh, is still with us and it's been... I've forgotten now, but decades of RS-232 hanging on there. Well, just look at Ethernet. Ethernet was invented in 73. Now, it's evolved considerably, but there's still identifiable, like the Ethernet packet format is pretty constant over that entire period. Uh, I wouldn't say forever, but I would say for startlingly long periods of time, things persist, like COBOL. I remember when COBOL was new. Uh, huh. So how about all those RS, uh, all the Ethernet cables that are in this, uh, holding together all those buildings out there? How long will those cables? I guess they'll be there as long as the buildings will be there, which is measured in decades. Buildings don't last. Do buildings last forever? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, yeah, most most don't. Um, well, the so ones held together by Ethernet cable, those are going to last forever. So ether Ethernet will outlast Cobalt then. Yeah, but it, it also started later, too. So uh, COBOL had a head start. Uh, so I, I was I was looking at a, an article the other day. Um, this is a DevOps team, and they have come up with a mechanism to wrap COBOL code into Kubernetes containers, right? So there's also a lot of you know re reinvention around the platform and, and delivery of technology. Well, in the network so, business, we call that encapsulation, where we take an old protocol and we carry it in a new protocol. Or the reverse, we take a new protocol and we carry it in an old protocol. So the old architecture of the AT&T systems called SONNET, synchronous optical networking. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time, you'd be carrying internet packets on SONNET links and vice versa. You'd be carrying what looked like SONNET links on top of packet systems. That's called, and all of that is to, is, you should think of it as, aiding the transition by preserving the install base. You don't have to throw it away right away. You can use it. It also accelerates uh, the new stuff because it it can just lay right on top of what's already there. So, you'll, so the internet currently runs on TCP IP, a protocol that was standardized in 19, um, I'll be generous, say 1980. Uh, it's been, so what's that, 40 years? Uh, for uh, 40 years of TCP IP. Uh, and that's not going away soon either. That's going to be hanging around for another 40 years probably. Yeah, I remember a lot of uh, Winsock uh, troubleshooting back in the day when that was a, a second driver that you would then, you know, install on your PC and TCP IP wasn't, wasn't included. Right? <laughs> um, so how do you recommend technologists um, – seize opportunities to not just focus on the tech because I mean certainly for me and, and others and my, pretty much everyone it's fun to play with toys it's fun to work with leading edge technology it's fun to just play with technology but the business actually is trying to achieve goals it's trying to make money and there's an opportunity for technologists to engage the business more so is that something that we should be encouraging folks to do is that is that something that's a, a missed opportunity that there's trap value in um, organizations with a lot of uh, uh, technologists and, um, and IT professionals, or does that really start more with a, um, uh, a an innovative management team that goes and pulls that creativity and innovation from that team? Well, only because you've used this phrase three times, am I going to mention it? You mentioned that it's the purpose of the company to make money, and you've you've contrasted that with uh, art. And I don't think that's the right way to look at it, to, to start answering your question. It's the purpose of a company to serve its customers. And making money is part of sustainability. That is, profit is a it, profit and sustainability are synonyms, although they're often used as opposites, you know, um, profit versus people, sustainability versus whatever. So, uh, so, you need to make money. Our goal at 3Com was to make 10% net profit on sales. 
it was a, a, like a law, a constant of the universe. We needed to make 10% net. That's what we owed our investors. We owed our investors 10%. Uh, but the engineers at the company were more, uh, including me, we were more focused on uh, serving the customer. That is, what are the customers need? And uh, in some cases, we thought we knew better than they did what they need. And I think that sometimes happens, but mostly they know better what they need. So, for example, when we first came out with our Ethernet cards, people would say, what do you use them for? And we would say, it's a platform. You can use it for millions of things. And then the customer would say, really? Well, wow, name one. And we had trouble naming one. That is, spreadsheets were the killer app for personal computers. What was the killer app for networking? And the first answer to that, which we got from customers, is printer sharing and file sharing and email. And that, and that became our killer app. And then later that was replaced by multi-user accounting systems. And later that was replaced by internet access. So now people buy uh, uh, PCs now to have, actually they're stopping buying PCs. They're buying cell phones now, <laughs> but the, the, you know, the purpose is to be on the network, not to balance your checkbook. So businesses then have an opportunity to encourage their technology professionals to just really focus on the customer and supporting them and then use that as the guide to help them develop their careers. Yes. And one thing we did to encourage exactly what you're driving at is when we launched a new product, we sent the engineers who developed that product out into the field. When, so in other words, when we rolled it out, the development engineers went to the field to see to sit with the customers and see what happened. And uh, we did, uh, <laughs> one of our mottos is, no news is not good news. So you had to go out and see how customers were. The mistake we used to make was shipping stuff to customers and then if we didn't hear any bad news, we assumed we had been successful. That is a dead end. You gotta go out and find out what the hell's going on out there. And, and doing it with the development engineers is a way of closing the loop on what customers really want and being sure our engineers are developing what the customers really want. So making customers part of that feedback loop. Making engineers part of that feedback and, loop. Yeah. Yeah, so, send, sending them out. Now, you don't want to send them too long because they don't like to get up early. No, no. Because if you stay up uh, on a hacking run until 2 o'clock in the morning, that just doesn't work. <laughs> Oh, is that um, your excuse? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and there's this. Well, why is it that customers get up so early relative to engineers? You know, maybe it's going back to your time at, at Park. Um, do technology, are technology professionals viewed as slightly different and they are, their natural uh, work tendencies are maybe a little more accommodated than sort of a more uniform enterprise experience? Everybody's a little bit different, and engineers have their differences too. And of course, then now we run the risk of stereotyping and generalizing. But uh, I think customers get up earlier than engineers as a general rule, and that creates stress because they want to have their damn breakfast meetings prior to the presentation, <laughs> and we don't we don't want to get up that. Or, oh, by the way, if I had it to do over again, I would start my company in New York instead of Palo Alto. Because it's a lot easier to attend a seven o'clock breakfast meeting in Palo Alto if you're in New York than it is to do the reverse because of that time zone thing. Uh, so imagine a 7 a.m. breakfast meeting in New York for a California engineer. That's <laughs> four o'clock in the morning for, uh, for her. So you talked about the internet and how it is continuously reinvented. Are we reinventing education? Because these days you're really focused on helping startups turn what looks to be really promising technology into useful tools, right? And that's for education and energy and healthcare. So talk to us a little bit about what you're doing now. What I'm doing now, well, I thought you were going to ask me about education and what it's hap what's happening there. I guess what I'm doing is uh, participating in the innovation of education. So K-12 education has been a steady decline for some time, and now you could even argue that university education is going down the same rat hole. Uh, but the uh, here comes the internet. It is almost as if the internet was developed in anticipation of COVID, because we 
when COVID hit, suddenly people turned to the internet to continue education, and it worked. We're finding at the University of Texas that many of the students and many of the faculty think it's working just fine over the internet, whereas just a few short months ago, I'll never teach over video because I need to be in the same room as my students. Well, that's most of that has gone by the boards, and we're so the gradual eroding of education, brick and mortar education, has been giving way to internet learning, and that trend is going to continue. It's it accelerate now. We're seeing it right now, and uh, I'm, the course I'm teaching at UT Austin is now entirely online, and I meet with 18 students twice a week uh, online. Uh, I think degrees. Uh, more and more students are picking and choosing the courses that they want to take or that they need for employment rather than a list of courses toward a degree. So I think degrees will uh, diminish in importance. And then there's the brands. You know, the UT Austin is a brand, Harvard's a brand, MIT's a brand. But now we're beginning to see professors be brands. Uh, like Christensen, the disruption professor, I believe his brand was uh, right up there with Harvard's brand. And uh, he could he he didn't need Harvard. He was a Harvard professor. May he rest in peace. He might have needed Harvard initially, but now the Christensen brand could stand on its own. So there's a whole different organization of uh, credibility in education. So the internet is having major impact on education. I guess i'm I'm not a education innovator, but I'm watching i'm uh, I'm a user, and I'm uh, also uh, delighting that the internet is delivering the goods. We're delivering the video in this case. But then you ask what I'm doing, which is a slightly different question. Uh, I'm doing many things, but the two most important is this new course I'm teaching to 18 students uh, twice a week for 90 minutes. Uh, and I'm teaching, the course's title is Startup Innovation, and I'm using the invention of Ethernet and the founding of 3Com as two case studies in the use of startups as tools of innovation. And it's a lot of work to teach a course, I'll tell you. So I'm doing that. The other thing I'm doing is I'm principal investigator on a Department of Energy contract to enhance the startup ecosystem for geothermal energy. That is uh, getting the oil and gas companies to drill not for hydrocarbons, but to drill for heat and then bring that heat to the surface and convert it to electricity. And uh, so our little project is the Department of Energy agreed with us that a good way to accelerate the advance of geothermal was to get some uh, encourage startups to take it up. And so that's what I'm working on. It's interesting, you know, you, you tend to mention uh, communications and energy in the same sentence when you're when you're talking about energy, especially <laughs> where where it's produced in the field with renewables, like with geothermal. Um, is connectivity then sort of a first step in uh, in pretty much all innovation now? Yes. Yep. I have a uh, a talk I give called connectivity, which argues that connectivity is a thing. And it's a thing that's uh, uh, everywhere, even in geothermal energy. Uh, the um, uh, look, you know how they communicate in many cases between the bottom of the well and the surface. They do so using sound waves through mud at single digit bits per second. So the digitization of uh, energy is progressing, and we're going to increase. We need to increase the bit rate from the um, bottom of the hole to the top of the hole, so we can build, uh, drill better wells. So, even in energy, uh, connectivity is uh, uh, has very positive effects on the advance uh, of energy. I, I tend to view energy as a network problem, and the. Ex and if we don't distribute energy, we exchange energy, different times of day, different levels of demand. So we're building what I called an internet, an energy sort of a play on internet, internet, uh, an energy network. Um, so so technology, so for, for future energy, technologies like 5G are then critical. Definitely. Yeah, in fact, this conversation that we're having, I think, uh, is going over a 5G network. I have to. Find, I'm going to digging into it. I'm communicating from my Mac through Wi-Fi to my iPhone, which is connected to the telephone network over cellular network. I know there's a 5G in there somewhere. I know there's an Ethernet in there somewhere. 
you've heard of LTE. Do you use LTE? Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Do you know LTE, what? It, the LTE uh, started appearing, what, five years after 4G? Yeah. And so what do you think LTE means, LTE? That is an acronym that I have forgotten. Well, in the telephone world, they think that it means long-term evolution. But I know better. It means leads to Ethernet. <laughs> you, when you talk on the phone, the telephone company tries to get you on an Ethernet as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why that's how I interpret LTE. Anyway, I'm using LTE now to talk to you uh, through Wi-Fi, through McIntosh. McIntosh. That is an interesting experience, right? We we uh, went from switched POTS networks with really great quality MOS, right? Mean opinion score where you you had um, operators listening to random calls and then grading them on a quality from one to five. <laughs> and to this day, we tolerate uh, maybe less quality and reliability in uh, mobile devices in exchange for that that mobility and that, that freedom to move. Well, that reminds me of the old days when the Bell Labs people uh, insisted that in order to communicate, you needed five nines of reliability. And that made everything clunky and expensive. So the internet people, we delivered nine fives of reliability. Yeah, resiliency. And to this day, that's one of the big advantages. Well, one of the big focuses for cloud maybe is that you are talking about things like eventual consensus, uh, consistency and being able to quickly recover and being able to make sure that you can restore from a backup and then that reduces risk. So that uh, resiliency to this day remains one of the things that seems to make that user experience really good. And that is a and that's a dimension of connectivity that is this resiliency that is there's a f going for efficiency, which sometimes is the opposite of going for uh, resilience. So, for example, having two copies of something makes the system generally makes it more resilient but less efficient because you're using mm -hmm. twice as much storage. So that's a dimension, uh, one that should be urgent right now. Our network is pretty fragile. Yeah, I think I might steal that from you. Um, I, in, instead of just saying that, you know, uh, availability is expensive or five nines is expensive. Um, it may be five nines is expensive, but users may actually like nine fives better. <laughs> so I got a question for you as we, we kind of come to the end of this conversation around predictions. And I mean, obviously, you know, it's a, a tech staple. Um, you've seen uh, plenty of those, especially as the CEO and editor of InfoWorld. So... Uh, you were talking about cloud now, right? And a lot of IT teams, especially in the operations side, they're really rethinking multi-cloud, for example. And we're predicting that they're gonna consolidate operations around fewer clouds or even single ones, right? So what do you think is on the horizon for tech pros? Like if you really step back from specific technologies, right? Like hybrid or connectivity uh, 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 technologies, what really is the big picture for technologists, right? What, 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 should, what should we be preparing for? Well, we've already touched on s several answers to this question, one of which is resilience, one of which is security, one of which is uh, uh, aggressively using connectivity. If you have a little doodad in your house that's standalone that you – you bought at Home Depot, as soon as you put it on the network, it becomes much more valuable than before. You can do many more things with it. So uh, in terms of mindsets, I would bring up a very connectivity intensive mindset. To, to how can more connectivity help here? Because it can generally, adding connectivity. And connectivity can also add to resilience. Uh, uh, here's one of my pet peeves. When my internet goes down, why do I have to call the cable company and tell them that my network is down? Why don't they know ahead of me? Why don't they know within milliseconds whether the network's down or not? Um, so there's a lot of uh, fragility out there that we can. Uh, so I would uh, take an anti-fragility or pro-resilience approach, connectivity intensive. Um, it's funny, cloud, uh, cloud is sort of after my time. I never sold cloud. Uh, I sold client server, which is a little bit like cloud, although the uh, the servers tended to be in the same building. Uh, so cloud is like a pendulum that swings back and forth. Uh, you know, the the uh, intensity of computation switches from the 
the big servers to the these little telephones have a lot of computation in them now. I think the pendulum is now swinging back toward uh, bringing stuff back down from the cloud and putting it on the on the edges. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see that come. That seems like a natural swing of the pendulum. So more local data and knowledge creation and edge services instead of ever more centralized systems. Because of the emergence of latency. So latency is, uh, low latency is required of uh, the Internet of Things. The things like to uh, have very low latency. And, to, and the extent to which you centralize things in the cloud, you add latency. So you want to bring things back from the cloud in order to reduce the latency and, and um, make things work. Yeah, the, the speed of light does tend to, you know, be an ultimate uh, uh, kibosh on everything, right? Um, you don't feel limited by the speed of light, do you? <laughs> I remember once upon a time we had a modem that we called uh, Luna because the total round trip time averaged around 500 milliseconds. And I have no idea how long the routing was on that. Um, that was the original spec for the Internet. 500 milliseconds? You needed to be able to send a character, an 8-bit character, needed to go from the terminal across the United States, be read by a time-sharing system, and the another character sent all the way back and printed. Right. And that round trip had to be under half a second. That was a spec. And now the, F, now the FCC is going to require um, Starlink to deliver sub-20 milliseconds in order to get some additional funding for um, uh, rural uh, internet connectivities. It, it does change a lot. Mm -hmm. So let's wrap up with a couple of final questions. So the first one is, I have seen you interviewed several times, right? And you've also certainly been interviewed in a lot of articles. You are a regular guest on panels. Um, <laughs> you've been asked probably just about every question, except maybe not. So what's something <laughs> that you wish that people would ask you, but they never do? Well, here's one. Uh, new technologies, like we've been talking about, can have one of two effects. One is to reduce cost, and the other is to increase revenue. Uh, which is more important? Well, you, you, at some, in some degree, you need both. But I've always said uh, increasing revenue is the priority, not reducing costs. So you, uh, maybe that's because I was selling stuff that I wanted you to buy, so I wanted you to. But I've always felt that there's more upside in re increasing revenue than there is in decreasing costs. That is, you can't innovate um, maximally by just focused on cost reduction because there's limit. You can't innovate by just cutting costs. You need to grow revenue. And that's a different mindset, the revenue growth versus the uh, cost cutting. That's a question I've, I've always had an opinion about that, but no one's ever, very few people know if no one has ever asked me that question. So for, for our audience who are IT professionals and, you know, IT is sort of, uh, not sort of, is obsessed in a lot of cases with cost consciousness. <laughs> You're saying that one, the, one of the first paths to innovation is to really start thinking about how those technologists are supporting revenue, not just reducing cost of operations. Yeah, the growth of revenue, which often means the introduction of new products that are uh, different from the ones you've been offering. But a focus on that versus cost cutting. Could, uh, cost cutting is limited. I mean, you you can bring your cost to zero eventually, then you can't do anything. But revenue is, you can grow that infinitely into the billions. So I think IT people should uh, emphasize, you can't give up on costs, but you should emphasize revenue growth rather than cost reduction. Thank you. All right, so here's our last question. Um, you have had you know, so many different roles over your career, um, and the thread between them is uh, really entrepreneurial. <laughs> so looking back, you know, what do you see as your legacy? Right. We know you for the Ethernet and for Metcalfe's Law and 3Com, but what what do you want to be remembered for? I don't think about that subject, but let me try to answer. Um, I invented Ethernet. Of course, that statement depends on what you mean by I and what you mean by invented and what you mean by Ethernet. But I think I'm stuck with that as, you know, my obituary will begin. He invented Ethernet. <laughs> There's not, not a lot I can do about that. Uh, 
I, well, I, I would prefer we, I would prefer that my legacy be bigger than that and include having been an internet pioneer. So the internet is bigger than Ethernet, and uh, I was lucky enough to arrive uh, in uh, January of 1970, and and, and uh, the Ether, the internet had only been operating since October 29th, 1969. So I was two months late uh, for being there at the beginning. Uh, the internet has just been such an incredibly positive experience. You talk about, or I talk about, freedom and prosperity. Uh, the the data is overwhelming that the the internet has had dramatic dramatic effect on uh, freedom and uh, prosperity, and the reduction of poverty and um, freedom of speech, and and so the internet is. Uh, so if I were to be remembered. It would be for the internet, but unfortunately, I'm stuck with he invented Ethernet, and that's that. Oh, and what I hate is he invented Ethernet, but Wi-Fi is now wiping it out. Wi-Fi is wireless Ethernet. That was its original name. They changed the name in 1999. So I tend to count, when I say Ethernet, I count Wi-Fi. <laughs> of course, there's 100 people who invented Wi-Fi, and they don't count. Uh, they don't count Ethernet as, as the same thing. Uh, the whole notion of bringing the Internet uh, to the very end, to um, desktops, to cell phones, uh, that's the idea of Ethernet. Well, conversations like this really make me think of you more as um, the father of, um, of available connectivity and a proponent and an advocate for it because you believe uh, deep down in your soul that increased connectivity of people and things and energy is how we actually move forward. And so I think of you as much more of an advocate for connectivity with Ethernet just being a mechanism to actually deliver that. I appreciate that. Yes, the, uh, there are people who frequently question connectivity, especially this day, you know, day and age with fake news and all that stuff going on. People are questioning the value of connectivity and they want to shut it down. I'm not over there. I'm over here, which my job is to connect things. And I think connecting things leads to freedom and prosperity and we should do more of it. Uh, and, and there are side effects that need to be taken care of, but they shouldn't set the tone. Well, I think that's a great point to end on. So, Bob, thank you so much for all of your time and being a part of um, our event. Um, and thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with our audience. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. For more information about TechPod, visit orangematter.solarwinds.com slash TechPod. For SolarWinds TechPod, this is Head Geek Patrick Hubbard. Thanks for listening. And until next time. <laughs>